it works very well at coffee hour, especially when there's lots of noise. Uh, again, we welcome you to the Monastery of St. Tikhon of Sedans. It's nice to have you with, this, uh, with us this evening, especially if you're visiting. Uh, we're glad that you're with us. If anybody would like to help uh, clean up after, uh, please uh, just stick around and, and we'll, we'll gladly uh, uh, utilize your assistance. At this time, uh, Dr. Christopher will come to, to introduce Dr. Christopher Benjamin, uh, our professor of patristics, will come to introduce Father Zacharias, uh, our speaker for this evening. Uh, well, Father Zacharias has asked me to uh, to be brief, so um, sober, sober, <laughs> sober, not brief. All right. So uh, I will just say that uh, uh, once upon a time, uh, a young lad of uh, sixteen years of age, born and raised in London, England, of Greek Cypriot parents, uh, visited for the first time to stay at the, the Monastery of St. John the Baptist. And uh, uh, that lad asked a certain Father Zosimus, as he was known at the time, whether he could uh, recommend something to read. And uh, Father Zosimus, Father Zacharias, kindly put a copy of the New Testament in that lad's hands <laughs> and said, you might like to begin with the uh, Gospel according to St. John. So, 40 years later, here I am uh, uh, introducing Father Zacharias uh, in the Monastery Trapeza of Saint Tikhon of Sadonsk. Uh, Father Zacharias is an uh, Archimandrite uh, of the Monastery of Saint John the Baptist in Essex, England, and a disciple of Elder Sophroni of Blessed Memory. Father Zacharias. Since Christopher reminded those years, I will say something. <clears throat> he was coming to the monastery, but I think he was a bit younger than 16. And every Sunday, he was going from one father to the other, asking to explain to him the mystery of the Holy Trinity. <laughs> he wanted to have a, a rational understanding of the mystery. He would come to me one Sunday, the next time, the next Sunday to Father Raphael, the other Sunday to no, Father Prokopi. And Father Prokopi got, got irritated by Christopher. And he, and he came to me and said, tell your young friend, we don't begin our life with, with, the, with the mystery of the Holy Trinity. We finish our life with that. <laughs> <laughs> and a few years later, of course, he had to study theology to, to, to find out for himself. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Father Sergius. Thank you, Christopher. I thank God that I am with you this evening. I was so tired, I brought even a, a paper to read for you. But I was so tired, I thought I would not be able to read it. I will stumble all the time. So I will say just a few words. <clears throat> well, we begin the triodium. We have begun it this evening. It's a wonderful period. It's a period given to us by God to work for our, re for our regeneration. And all the priests, all, all the feasts of the year, they had this, this purpose. For example, Sunday, what is a Sunday? It's the day of the Lord. It's a day that we are supposed to be still 
and live it with the study of the Word of God, with, with prayer, and of course, above all, with the liturgy. It's a day when we are supposed to gather the energy of God, the energy of the Holy Spirit, to enable, to enable us to do the bodily works of the rest of the week. And all the feasts of the year have this purpose, to help us to learn, to gather the traces of the Holy Spirit, to accumulate them in our heart, so as to be able to pass the rest of the time as far as possible without sin. This is the plan we have in our church. That's why in every service we, we hear, God say for Lord this day to keep us without sin. In the evening, God say for Lord this evening to keep us without sin. In the night, in the complaint, God say for Lord to keep us this night without sin. There is not another program in our life because the more we, the less we sin, the more immortal we become. And, and when we have struggled lawfully and overcome sin, then we, we really become incorruptible. So this is the meaning of Sunday and of all the feasts. And we see this, for this reason the church has <coughs> instituted feasts and above all this great period of great land. It is really a time when God is honoring us, giving us the opportunity to renew our life because it's a time set apart for all the members of the church to do the same thing. And it stirs up such an atmosphere that it helps all of us to find the grace of renewal of our life. And because the Great Land is so, is so important, you know how I see the meaning of the Great Land. It's a time when we try to exercise ourselves in tasting a little death in order to know the life of resurrection. The more we taste death, the more strongly we participate in the grace of the resurrection. And of course, the idea is to be able to say what is written in the, what the Lord says in the book of the Revelation. I became, how he says, I was dead, and behold, I live unto all ages. This is the purpose of Lent. To be able, that's why we try to taste a little bit of death through fasting, through prayer, through the confession of our sins, through all the practices that the, the church suggests to us. And all these things, in reality, is not a burden, it's not a task, it is an honor that God is making to us in order to give us the grace of resurrection. And because the period of Lent, when we are, we are about to exercise ourselves in, in, in this pattern of the passage from death to life, because it's so important, this period, there are certain Sundays before Lent who give us some constants to keep in mind during our struggle for our renewal during Lent. We begin tomorrow, it's the day I think of the Pharisee and the publican, huh? tomorrow. In the, <clears throat> the, in the week after of the prodigal son. The week after is the Sunday of the judgment. And the, the last week before <clears throat> Lent 
is the Sunday of forgiveness or the Sunday of the expansion from paradise of the first created people. We have some, the church is giving us some constants, like in mathematics, we have to sometimes to introduce some constants in the formulas so that the formulas work and they, <clears throat> and they, they work so that we know the, the laws, the natural laws that govern the relationships of the phenomena. So it is in the spiritual life the church is giving us some constants to bear always in mind so that we may be successful in our purpose. Even before the, the Sundays of, of the Triodion, we have one or two Sundays which are very important in view of that. <clears throat> that of the Canaanite woman and that of Zacchaeus. Canaanite, the, that of the Canaanite woman is a tremendous lesson for us, especially for monks. If we manage to, to humble ourselves and learn discipleship in the church and be such disciples as the Canaanite woman, that is to say, to accept to become little dogs following our master and whether he shows good pleasure or displeasure to keep the same fidelity and love, at the, at, at the end we'll receive the grace of the adoption, of divine adoption. She accepted to be a little talk, the woman, and at the end the Lord said to her, woman, daughter, great is thy faith. She received the grace of adoption. So, and in general, with our God, <coughs> If we, if we accept his chastening, his education, he is offered to us as a father, says St. Paul. We, the purpose is to receive the grace of divine adoption. That is the lesson of, the, of, of that Sunday. Then comes the Sunday of Zacchaeus. Great lesson again. If we, if we manage in our effort to learn the spirit of Christ, the humble spirit of Christ, if we manage to suffer some shame for his sake, like Zacchaeus, he made himself ridiculous to climb on a tree, such an important personage. If we manage to bear shame for the sake of the Lord, we receive the fourfold enlargement of grace, which are the dimensions of the cross. You remember in the epistle to the Ephesians says that we cannot really comprehend the depth, the height, the breadth, and, and the length of the, love, of the love of God, but with all the saints. These four dimensions of the cross, they are the dimensions of the cross and whenever we suffer shame in our effort to reconcile ourselves with God in our repentance, the mystery of his cross and resurrection is active in our lives. We receive exactly like Zacchaeus the enlargement, the fourfold enlargement of the heart. And it's very easy to understand. As the Lord was going for his saving passion to Jerusalem for the last time, and he was full of that spirit of his love to the end, he sees someone who suffers shame on the tree in order to see his face, and he notices him, he visits him, and he becomes salvation to his whole house. And he, and he gives him, in a prophetic way, the fourfold enlargement of, the, of his cross and resurrection. 
Because when we suffer shame for the sake of, of our reconciliation with God, that shame, be, that shame becomes power for regeneration, power to overcome the passions and sin. Because whenever we suffer shame for the sake of the Lord, it's considered to be a thanksgiving for the shame he suffered in order to save us. And for that, he transmits, transmits to us his grace, his life, his state. <clears throat> that is the meaning of the Sunday of Zacchaeus. Then comes the Sunday tomorrow of the Pharisee and the publican. And we see in the person of this, in, the, in these two persons, the whole human race divided into two categories. The ones who are proud and justify themselves, and the ones who come to God with a contrite heart, and they are ready to bear shame and pain. He was beating even his chest, saying, be merciful unto me, O God. <clears throat> and we see that those who justify themselves, they hate their own soul. They never manage to approach God. God hates self-justification. But those who manage to humble themselves <clears throat> and, bear for, and bear pain for his sake, <clears throat> It is easy for them to relate with him because he is the, the father of mercy and the God of every consolation. One, one elder used to say, you want to know God? It is very easy. Just approach him with a painful heart, with a contrary spirit and a, and a, humble, and a humble heart and you and you and he, and the Lord will unite with your spirit. So that's the lesson we, we, we learn tomorrow. If we, if we lower our head and we pray humbly like the publican and we lower even more our mind, then surely we'll be justified by the Lord. God does not judge twice. If we <clears throat> anticipate his judgment, condemning ourselves before him for our wretchedness, he can he can only he can only justify us. He can only save us. God, as St. Paul says, does not just does not just does, does not <clears throat> judge twice. But if we voluntarily prevent, in the ancient meaning of prevent, go before the judgment of the Lord, then we are justified. That is the lesson we learn tomorrow. We mustn't forget that our God is the God of mercy and every consolation. And it is easy to relate, to relate with him, to relate to relate to him, to relate with him, <clears throat> if we approach him with a contrite spirit and a humble heart. It's his nature. He says, I don't want sacrifice. I, I want mercy. What he means, I don't want external works of piety. I want you to open your heart to to humble yourselves and open your heart so that I can pour my mercy in your hearts. I want you to accommodate my mercy, my, my mercy. that's what it means. That is the a meaning of tomorrow's day. Then comes the, the day, the next Sunday of the prodigal son. Then we learn another lesson, that unless, unless we come to ourselves, unless we come to ourselves and we confess our sinfulness, our mind will not reach the heart, will not unite with the heart. 
and therefore we will not be able to speak to God properly. God only notice, God only hears us when we speak to Him from our heart, and He wants our whole heart in His first and great commandment. So, unless we confess our sinfulness and crucify our mind to the precepts of the gospel, the mind will not descend, will not unite with the heart, and therefore will not be able to make a true confession and therefore be justified. Again, in, the, in that Sunday, we have the whole humanity divided into two categories. The prodigal son who repents, who finds his heart, and remember, if we find our heart, we found our life. We, we have the possibility to be saved. If we don't find our heart, I don't know. Uh, so, again there, in that passage of the Gospel, we, we see the whole of humanity in two categories. The prodigal son, who manages to find his heart and speak to God, and God hear him even from a distance and come out to meet him. And we have the, the older son, who justifies himself, who thinks that <coughs> with his external works obliged God to, to owe him every favor. In fact, he showed that he never approached his father with his heart. He was living in the house of the father without ever connecting with the heart of his father because he didn't, he didn't find his own heart. <clears throat> In this life, whatever we do, it will pass away. It will be swept away. Only the work we do on our heart will accompany us, will accompany us beyond the grave. And that we see in the day, in the Sunday of the Judgment, the third Sunday of the Triodion. Again, the whole of humanity divided into two categories. And we see these two categories standing in the judgment of God, the just people on his right and the sinners on, on his left. And what do we see? God glorifies the just men, and even while they are, he is glorifying them, they say, but, but Lord, when have, when have we done anything good upon earth? They humble themselves even more, because they have learned in their life the mystery of God, the, the way of God, that the more, we, the more we humble ourselves when we come before God, the more we'll end up rejoicing in, rejoicing in Him. St. John of the Lada says, approach God as much as you can without boldness, and you'll find more boldness afterwards. So, the just men who learned in their life always to reproach themselves, to take upon them every blame, and give glory, all justice, and give give God all glory and justice, that was a work on their heart, which accompanied them beyond the grave, and they stand in front of the Pantocrator, Jesus, the Almighty Jesus. He addresses his praise to them, and with, the, with his voice, he imparts to them his glory, and yet they even humble themselves even more. The others who learned in this life to be arrogant and to justify themselves, they stand in the presence of the Almighty God and they cannot reason properly. They justify themselves, they hear the voice of the Almighty Judge, the eternal Judge, and they, still, they are still arrogant. And of course, of course they perish. So, all the attitudes that we <coughs> cultivate in this life, they, they accompany us beyond the grave. And if we learn in this life always to reproach ourselves before God,
take the blame upon us and give always glory, justice, thanksgivings to God, surely that will accompany us. That will make us angel, as the Lord said. That is the purpose, to make us angel. And what do the angels do? They have things, wings. And, and, and it is say, and the prophet says, we twain they cover their faces. We twain of their wings they cover their feet. And only we twain they do fly around the throne of glory, the throne of God. What does that mean? They have six wings and they only use two wings to fly. The other four to safeguard their humility because they know that they need more humility in order to uh, be penetrated with, uh, by more glory from God. The more they humble themselves, every molecule, every particle of their being will be, will be penetrated by the glory of God. That's why they are unceasingly, unceasingly glorifying God. They have such a desire, such a thirst, because their humility is double than, uh, than the effort they put to fly around the throne of glory of God. So we learn another lesson in this, in this third Sunday of the judgment. And of course, it comes this, the Sunday of forgiveness, the Sunday just at the threshold of the great land. There, there are many, there are many, there are many lessons that we can receive, but I will only say two. The one in the gospel it speaks about uh, expansion. The hymn, the hymns as well, the of the church. They speak, they speak about the expa expansion of the first created people from paradise to show us that we are just wounded people wounded by sin. We have all sinned. We have all sinned and come short to the glory of the glory of God. And unless we have this consciousness, we won't be able to profit from the period that is ahead of us. We won't be, we won't be able to find the full benefit of this wonderful period of great land, which is full of the grace of God. We must remember that we are wounded people, sinful people, and far, in a far country, far, we are so far from God, and that to keep our, our spirit humble. We need a humble spirit. The Gospel of Christ, in the Gospel of Christ there is only one school, the school of humility, to learn humility, because is the is the way, is the function by which he revealed himself to us. And the more and the more we humble ourselves, the more he glorifies us. And there are many expressions in the scriptures where it is said, He gives grace to the humble and he resists the proud, whoever is, is humble shall be exalted, and whoever exalts himself shall be um, abased and so on. Uh, so we must remember our sinfulness, that we are wounded, that we are in need of a phys physician. He came not for those who are whole, for those who are well, without any pain. He came for those who are wounded, for those who have the need of a physician. That's the first lesson. And the other lesson, if we have that, if we have that consciousness, surely our heart will be soft and forgive the debts, the minor debts of our fellow people, since God is forgiving us great debts. We then forgive minor debts to our fellows. Someone who is contrite because of this consciousness of his sinfulness, will never judge his fellows, will never be hard to his fellows. He knows 
he knows how to be compassionate and for, forgives everybody everything as the Lord forgave, forgave us. And with this constance in our mind, which we are taught um, during the Sundays I spoke about, six Sundays before Lent, we enter Lent and we try to we try to work on to work together with God for our regeneration, for our renewal, which is for salvation. I don't know, I have, I have taken nearly half an hour for should I continue because we could say a few words even for each Sunday of Lent. That is a little meaning. No, not a little. I could say a little word about each Sunday of Lent. First Sunday of Lent comes the Sunday of Orthodoxy, which is a tra tra a great feast, the trial of the faith, in order to teach us that the sanctification and the healing we are seeking during this period, we cannot receive it without the integrity of faith. Our fathers knew that the, the St. Basil, the great, says, don't expect holy life from a heretic. Without the Orthodox faith, we cannot be healed and we cannot be saved. And that is the lesson we, we derive in this Sunday. We need a true understanding and the true, the true revelation which will give us the true inspiration. All the other constants, they are good, I said. But more, most inspiring is the revelation of the beauty and justice and truth of our God. That will give us the maximum of the inspiration. That is the, the meaning of this Sunday. A little, little word, I don't pretend to say everything, but a few words about each Sunday. I thought this during the service to speak about this because I didn't have the strength to read my paper. I had a paper about the the despondency of the world and the and the zeal of the children of God. That was the theme of my paper, but we leave, we left it. Uh, then we come to the second Sunday of Lent. It's a Sunday dedicated to Saint Gregory Palamas. Normally, it should be we should have there the feast of Transfiguration, which took took. Uh, place about 40 days before the crucifixion of our Lord. We should have that feast. But the church changed the place of that feast and put it on the, uh, on the 6th of August and made another feast of the elevation of the Holy Cross on the 14th of September. So, but there is something secret there. We celebrate St. Gregory Palamas, who is the theologian who expounded and who expounded and theologized about the uncreated light that shone at the transfiguration of our Lord. So the, the fruit of the right faith and the fruit of a humble labor during Lent should be the illumination of our souls by this uncreated light of, of God, which forms in our hearts the image of our Savior. A few words upon this Sunday. There is a mystical meaning, that is to say, a spiritual meaning on that Sunday. Then comes the Sunday of the cross, the third Sunday. In the middle of Lent, to remind us 
that the cross of our Lord is the center of everything, is, is what saved us. It, it, it is what saved us. And because the church cannot repeat enough the words of the Lord, whoever wants to follow me, let him take up his cross, deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He cannot, the church cannot repeat those words which are so significant. He elevates the cross that we can see it all the time. And remember the words of the Lord. Whoever wants to follow me, say, says the Lord, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants, whoever loves, if we love God, we take the cross, we follow him in. Whoever wants it means whoever loves. Like in the Old Testament, the Jews knew and, and spoke to God in their prayers and said, For the sake of thy words, O Lord, I will stick to the hard path, says in the psalm. And now the cross is lifted up in the middle of land so that we can gaze at it and say, for the sake of thy cross, O Lord, for the sake of the sacrifice, the love to the end you showed for us, I'll bear gladly this honor of land, the labor of land, which is an honor and a privilege. That is the meaning of the Sunday of the cross. Whoever wants, whoever loves, let him deny himself. Doesn't mean we must deny neither our soul nor our body. Our soul is as precious and even more than the whole world. We don't deny our body. St. Paul says, each one nurtures and takes care of his body. Because God has given our body to help us to work out our, our salvation. That's why in the second judgment, we must rise again and be presented with our bodies before the Lord to receive reward or punishment for the good things or the bad things we have done with our bodies. That's why you have to rise again. The full, the full recompense is not given yet unless we rise from the dead. So let him deny, let him deny himself. It's not our body and not our soul. But the evil, the wrong attitudes we have acquired and which became our soul, not our immortal soul, but the passions which became our soul. Let, let us deny that and take our cross, our cross, not the cross of the Lord. The cross of the Lord was so great and so frightening that if it fell upon us, it would turn us to powder. The Lord fell upon the Lord, and you know, he bruised him all over. But he had to, in order to save us, to heal our infirmity. He took upon him all our infirmities, all the tragedy of our sins and our fall, in order to heal all, all things. Not to take that cross. Nobody could, could touch that cross. But our cross, what is our cross? Those afflictions and those trials that each one of us needs in order to detach himself <coughs> from every attachment in this world, from every passionate attachment in this world, and with a free heart to run the way of the commandments of the Lord, to follow the Lord, each one of us. We don't in we don't invent our crosses. The providence of God grants us our personal, our particular cross. Just what we need to liberate ourselves from the captivity of our passionate attachments in this world. So, great mystery, a great wisdom. What is few about that Sunday of the, of, of the cross? And then, of course, comes the next Sunday, and it's the Sunday of St. John of the Ladder, I think, the, the, the fourth Sunday, to show us that the, 
the fruit of crucified life, of the crucified life, of those who are friends of the cross, is the holy life. The life of the Osi, of the holy ones. In English, we don't have this distinction between Osios and Agios. Yes, Prepatopni, Isiatori. So, we, the fruit of the crucified life is surely the saints of God, the friends of his cross, of, of, of his cross, the assembly of the gods by grace in whom he is glorified. And the Sunday after is the Sunday, the fifth Sunday of Lent, is the Sunday of, of the of Saint Mary of Egypt to show us that the power of the cross can accomplish everything. Those things which are impossible for men are possible for God. And we see that in the person of Saint Mary of Egypt. And, and God wants to do that for us, to do the impossible for our salvation, because that glorifies him even more. So when we believe, when we believe that he is able to do that which is impossible for men, for our salvation, it is possible for him. When we believe like that, God is well pleased because it, it, it glorifies him. St. Mary of Virgin glorified God because God did that which was not possible for men, but it was possible for God to do. And that was, we can see the power of his cross and resurrection. We can see the power of his gospel. We can change radically anybody's life. No matter in what pit of destruction has descended. And then comes the Sunday of Palm Sunday, the Sunday before the Holy Week. That is a great Sunday, great feast. It has a prophetic character. It, 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 there is a cleanse there of the fashion by which our Lord will be revealed in the last in the last day. And uh, having gone through Lent forty days and having received the grace of the Holy Spirit. We become contemporaries of eternal events. And we can hold the palm, palm leaves and say, blessed is he, blessed, how is it? Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Because we have struggled for 40 days, received the, gra the grace of the cross and resurrection, the grace of Christ, that grace has helped us to enter events which are eternal, become contemporaries of eternal events, and stand before God, and like contemporaries of those events, to say, blessed is he that cometh now in the name, in the name of the Lord. It has a bit, an eschatological, not a bit, it, it has an eschatological meaning and aspect, the Sunday, the Palm Sunday. And then, of course, comes Holy Week. Each day there has a special meaning. But what strikes me during the Holy Week, just before the Passion of the Lord, because he had such a desire to be baptized in the baptism of death for our sakes. And he was ascending. He went like a lightning through Samaria, not turning left or right. And the apostles were frightened to follow him. There is another mystery there. But he, he was going like a lightning to ascend Golgotha in order to be baptized in the baptism of his death, which is really the revelation of his infinite love for our salvation. And we see in this passage more than ever the Spirit of the Lord is boiling with the with his love. Whoever comes into contact with him, with him in this passage, is transformed. But in two ways. Those who 
find a little humble, a hum, humble opening in their souls, they receive this grace and they are changed radically. Like the, the harlot, like Zacchaeus, as we said, and then like even at the cross, like the centurion at the cross, the, the good thief on the cross, all these people, they experienced this furnace of love in, in the Lord, which transmade them. Some others, of course, they, they became even more, more hard because Christ is the son of justice, the son of righteousness. And like this visible material son, when he warms the earth, what is mud becomes harder, becomes like a rock. What is wax becomes soft. And you can imprint on that wax any image you like. It's the same with the Son of Righteousness. When we have a humble heart, He softens our heart. When we turn to Him and we believe in Him and we accept His Word, the heat of His grace softens our heart so that He can imprint His image on our heart. That is what the prayer of the church is, as St. Paul says, children whom I beseech until Christ is formed in your hearts, is formed in you. So, and the, the others, of course, who don't accept his word, who reject obstinately his, his gospel, they are hardened. And this is the, the thief on the left. These are the Jews who were crying, come down from the cross so that we can believe, and so on. So each, each day that week has a special meaning, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and so on. But uh, it's too long. We cannot speak about everything. But. Uh, I said something and I didn't explain it. When the Lord was ascending on Gotham, the, the disciples were following the Lord in amazement, in fear, in trembling. And you know why? Because the way was not yet clear. In the way there was death. But after the cross and resurrection of, of our Lord, the Lord has cleared the way from death. That's why then, after the cross and resurrection of the Lord, the apostles were not afraid of death anymore. That's why they came out of the synedrium of the, of the Jews, beaten to death, and they came out rejoicing because they were, they were vouchsafed worthy to suffer for his name, they, say, they said. And when St. Paul was, when the Christians tried to stop him going up, going up to Jerusalem because he was going to suffer death, he says to them, what are you doing with me, stopping me to go up to Jerusalem? I'm ready to die for his name. I don't consider my soul of any value. I'm ready to die for his name. That was, that was the disposition and the inner strength of the apostles and of the Christians after the death and resurrection of Christ, when he has cleared the way from death. But before, as the Lord was going up to, to Golgotha, in order, in order to do that, the disciples were frightened. And, they, and we know how even they dispersed during those um, awesome days of his passion. A few, a few things to know about this great peri period that is ahead of us. It's a wonderful period with a lot of grace. And you know, we must learn to see everything that the church ordains for us, everything that the gospel says to us, to see there's a great honor offered to us, a great privilege 
God is giving us a chance to become, to show, to show our fidelity and our love to Him and become nothing less, nothing less than what He is by His grace, of course. Forgive me. So thank you so much, Father Zacharias. Um, I took longer, Father. That's Three okay. Quarters, one that's okay. Father Bartholomew is going to go around with the uh, microphone. If you have a question, Father Zacharias, maybe if you could stay up in the front and uh, we can have a, a few questions at this time. Close to your mouth. Excuse me, is that better? Okay. Um, how does one not uh, fall into despair? What is the proper way to condemn oneself without? Yes. Yes. That's, I mean, not too far out of the love to the fire. My, my, my experience is that I do it too much. Of, Thank you. You know. you know, we don't despair because we do it out of gratitude for the Lord. We feel that we should thank Him so much. And we find ourselves unable, un unable to thank him worthily for what he has done. And then we are ready to hate even ourselves. We would like to thank him properly as we owe him and as he deserves. And we can't. And for this reason, we curse our wretchedness. We cannot thank this God of ours, such a God of ours, who, who can describe such such a God. And it's this self-reproach, self-blaming is so valuable because it's voluntary. We want to do it, do it out of gratitude, out of gratitude to the Lord. And because we cannot satisfy the desire of our heart to thank Him as we ought, we grieve and say, how oh, wretched as I am. And that's how all the prophets reacted every time God revealed himself to them. You find wonderful expressions by the prophets and the apostles every time they perceived the glory, the glory of God. It's a voluntary exploit, 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 exploit. It's a voluntary exploit. And whoever does that, He's assimilated, the Holy Father say, whoever does not, he's assimilated to the mystery of the cross and resurrection of Christ. Because as the cross and resurrection of Christ were voluntary, a voluntary death for, this, for the sake of our death, which was involuntary and as a punishment for the sin, for the sin that preceded it, in the same way, this self-reproach and self-blaming is a voluntary one for the sake of the Lord and for this reason it has value and, and acquires the grace of Christ. Once I was in Greece, I was giving a talk in, in Patras and many, uh, there were many people there and they started asking me questions and I answered their questions for about an hour and a half and at the end, I said to them, I will ask you one question, and we'll finish the meeting. And I said to them, what is the greatest commandment in the New Testament? And one lifted up his hand and he said, to love God with all our heart and so on. I said, no. Another one lifted up his hand and he said, to love our neighbor as ourselves. I said, no. Another one said, to love one another as he has loved us. As he has loved us. I said, no. Another one said, to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. The Lord said, I said, no. He said, but what it is? I said, I'll tell you. Open your gospel, open your New Testament, St. Luke's gospel, chapter 17, verse 10, where he says, when you fulfill all the commandments that I have given you, says the Lord, Say to yourselves that you are useless servants and you have done that which you ought to have done. 
That is to say, having fulfilled all those commandments, we still have to fulfill another commandment, to keep a humble spirit, to say to the Lord, Lord, I'm useless, I'm a useless servant. That's the meaning. That's the meaning. When we reproach ourselves and blame ourselves and give glory to God, we are fulfilling the greatest commandment of the New Testament, which we read in St. Luke's Gospel, I don't think anything because the judgment is already pronounced at the moment of death and whatever they do to the body is not important but those who accept that that means they don't have understanding of the destiny of our body of the resurrection of our bodies in the last day I don't want to judge, uh, to judge those who are cremated, but I think it's a pity. I think there is a lack of understanding of the destiny of man as we know it in the revelation of our Lord. In, in any case, there are many righteous people that were burned doesn't mean anything, the burning of the body. God is able to raise again man from the ashes. There, is no, there are no bounds to, to his omnipotence. Uh, but the judgment already is pronounced at the moment of our, of our death, even before our death. So I don't I don't have anything more to say. Well, if the judgment is already pronounced, then what's the point of doing the mimosida and praying for the dead? Well, the judgment is partial. The judgment is partial. I know that God wants to save everybody. I don't say that everybody is saved. That is the desire of God to save everybody. But he cannot save everybody by force. But uh, he always wants to save us with our cooperation. He wants, he will not do anything by imposition because he's a kind God who respects the gift of freedom he gave us a, when he created us. So he will not do anything without human cooperation. And sometimes we, in good faith, we pray in the church to offer that part of the human cooperation for the souls who have departed before us in case, in case that we can help and make up for what they didn't manage in this life. That is not an absolute thing. It's just a prayer. God is not bound by that prayer to save anybody. And also, God wants to save everybody. But he, he, he demands the 
to the human cooperation, the human factor. We see sometimes they, they bring an input and they, they make an opening in the roof of the house and they descend the man in front of the an impotent man in front of in front of the Lord to heal him. And because of the faith of those people that they, they dropped him from the roof in front of him, he heals that person. Something like that. But the, the church and the saints of God, they prayed with fiery pray uh, with fiery tears and prayers for the salvation of all the world. And their prayer sustains the world. And it's a strength available there. So if there is still a little humble opening in their souls, they can receive from that, which is a prayer of the church, the prayer of the saints, and make this in, uh, change in their inter eternal destiny. I don't know how else to say it. But there is no necessity in God. And we know that there is a desire that all should be saved, and that desire is manifested in the lives of the saints, but we cannot do we can neither God nor we can neither we can force God, neither God can force us. my own life and perhaps in the lives of others when we reproach ourselves and blame ourselves sometimes it seems to um, somebody against me I blame myself and then I just keep having thoughts and feelings against a person and I have to struggle and endure the pain at other times um, it seems you can reproach yourself and then your heart is made tender and you're filled with love and compassion for the others. But why does one happen at some times and the other one happen at other times? It depends how we do it. It depends how we do it. <coughs> In any case, <coughs> um, the saints of our church, I found this teaching in St. Simon, and, and in another way, in St. John of the Ladder. They, they, they classify, how to say, no, not the class, they evaluate the, the, the progress, the spiritual progress of someone uh, in the way he can take blame or he can take injustice or he can take insults. And they say the first step is when we force ourselves not to react back, not to answer back, not to retaliate. The second step is when we pray for the one who caused the suffering to us, the, the injustice or the, the evil. The, then we, it means that we have made more progress and they say when we have when we have compassion for the one who has caused affliction to us and we pray to God out of compassion for the having in mind the harm that he he suffered his soul suffered in doing that we are even we have even made more progress we have received that is to say more the bowels of Christ, the bowels of compassion. So, sometimes, but it's good always to force ourselves. And sometimes we would be like that, as you said, and sometimes in a good way. And if we force ourselves, God will, God will help us, and at, and at the end, there will only be the good reaction, the good result. Uh, forgive me, this is a more personal question. Um, I've been a Christian for most of my life, and I used to feel a lot of passion for God. 
I'd love to work out. Yes. <laughs> it's okay. I used to feel a lot of passion, you know, love for God, but in the past couple of years have fell into like spiritual numbness or apathy. And I don't know. Don't do one. You are not the only one. We are all fellow sufferers. Uh, we, we, in the beginning, we receive abundant grace and freely, having not done anything to merit it. Well, it is the goodness of the Lord to give us a lesson. And we experience what it is spiritual prayer, what is humility, what is love, all those things, all those good things. And then this grace is withdrawn, is taken from us. And God does it like that with a purpose, to see how we react, to see if we have learned the lesson he gave us. If we still behave like in the first period when the grace was active in our heart, and we, and we do the same good works that we did then, while the grace is taken away from us, it will come back and even more. It will come back to us and even stronger. That's what he said to, to Thomas. Because thou hast seen Thomas, he says to him, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. When the grace is with us, it's like seeing God within us. And we have his strength to do all the good works of piety and all the, uh, and all the uh, good spiritual works. But when this grace is taken away and we still do those things with fidelity, with good disposition, and, and we show we use our freedom correctly then, then grace comes back. Then God, we, then God is convinced that we, we love him. You, you know, we say to him in the midnight service every day, Lord, I'm dying, save me. But Father Suhrani, our Father Founder, used to say, who art thou, a man, to say to God, I am dying, save me. Convince God that you are his. So it's a way to convince God when he takes the grace from us, to convince him that we are his. And then he comes and he says to us, Yes, thou art mine. This day have I begotten thee. All that is mine is thine. That is the idea of that period. The, this period that follows the first period of grace is a very... I hope I didn't disturb it. I, I, it is a, a special gift. It is a special gift, this period, to, to come to convince God. When grace is with us, God is with us. When grace is not with us, it's hell. What is hell? The absence of God. And when God is absent from our life, it's hell. And when we are in the hell of, of this absence, and we still believe and follow the Lord, that means the death of this hell who threatens our life, it's not as strong as our faith. Our faith is stronger than the death that threatens our life and the hell that torments us. And we overcome death and we overcome sin in that way. It's a very precious time. And we may, we may have a lowering, we may have a, a ephesis. I don't know how you say ephesis in music. How, what is called that? The ephesis is called down sharp and uh, flat. Yes, flat we, we go yeah. down. We may we may go down, but we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't remain down. Saint Macarius the Great says, when we are down, we mustn't think that we remain down. We must make a new beginning, and we'll go up again. And all our life is going up and down in reality, because God is wanting to give us a big lesson that salvation is not ours, it's not our merit. Salvation 
is the free gift of God. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful period, actually, the second period. Again, it's a privilege, it's an honor. When God takes his grace away from us to try us, it's an honor he's making to us in order to give us the possibility to convince him that we are his and then to come back and say, yes, thou art mine. All that is mine is thine. Forgive me, I, I, we are all fellow sufferers. We are all struggling with that. None of us can keep that first grace as we hear from our fathers. No one. And the maximum period that one can keep that first grace may be seven years. But long years will come afterwards of trial. But whoever, be, whoever follows the Lord and during that period and tries to keep the lessons he received in the first period, he will be, uh, he, he will make a triumphant entrance into his kingdom, a rich entrance, as St. Peter says, into the kingdom. I thought was a gentleman down there. <laughs> During the Lent period, I um, often try to do better with confession, but I often feel my confessions are weak, um, and I was just wondering if you might have some pointers on how to improve my confession. It would be like I'm trying to collect how my week has gone by the time Vespers is gone and I'm finished and I go to confession, all the thoughts are gone. And I don't know what to say. And I was wondering what I could do to better my confession. Confession is a Confession is again a great honor God is making to us. And the benefit of the confession is proportional to the shame we voluntarily take upon us to expose the wounds, the wounds of our soul. Uh, uh, because the Lord who saved us with the sacrifice on the cross of shame 
when we suffer shame in order to be reconciled with him in confession, he considers it as a, a thanksgiving for what he did for us, and he impounds grace to us. That's why many times out of the confession we come out regenerated. Well, sometimes the confession is from the heart, and we receive more, more blessing, more strength, and sometimes it's not that strong, we don't feel it. But it's always beneficial, I think. Like when you have a garden, you don't just wait at the garden once and you leave it. You keep waiting the garden. Take out the, the bud, the, the weeds from the garden to have, to have it clean, to, to bring fruit. So, as a people sometimes say, but should I confess again and again the same things? Yes, we are weeding our garden. Our garden. And so, to, to be able to give more food. So, don't worry, just do it with a good conscience. And sometimes it will be powerful, sometimes less powerful, but always beneficial. But it's a very, very great thing. It's a pity some people go to confession that they're afraid to bear shame, and they, they mumble something, and they say, nothing much, Father, nothing, nothing serious. The usual things, small things. They're afraid in case the priest makes a, a bad impression, makes a, forms a bad impression of them. On the contrary, the priest, when he confesses someone and he sees real shame in him, confessing his shame, confessing his sins and taking shame upon him in order to be reconciled with God, I'm telling you, the priest is filled with awe and reverence for the person because he knows that time God has his hand upon that person, refashioning that, that, pe uh, that person. And you are in fear in front of people who confess properly, not to stop the work of God, the work of regeneration that he offers, the grace of regeneration he offers <coughs> to those people. The whole of heaven is on their side. The Lord said, when someone repents, the whole heaven rejoices. All heaven is on the side of the penitent when he does it in, in an honest and sincere way. So there is a great benefit in confession, a great honor, a great honor that God is offering to us. And I will tell you, nowadays, when even in, our, in, in the monasteries, we are not very good ascetics. We have hardly any asceticism. And this is a general phenomenon. It's not, it's not here or there. Everywhere is like that. This shame of confession can, can sometimes make up for what is lacking in us. We lack asceticism, we lack effort, but if we take upon us shame in confession voluntarily, God will give us plenty of grace to overcome <coughs> the passions and, and sin. Forgive me. Thank you so much, Father, for everything you're sharing with us. I'm wondering if you might have some words about the, uh, the vision of marriage in our church, and the vision of marriage in our church, and, and especially in light of all the attacks upon marriage in our surrounding society. Attacks. Attacks against marriage in our society. Speak about the vision of marriage, especially having in mind that society attacks marriage. Society attacks. Oh, attacks, attacks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Good translation. Sorry, David. That's okay. I don't know what to say about marriage, but I, I think I know maybe even more that you were married, though I'm not married. Because 
the same principles which apply to the monastic life apply in marriage. For example, we were saying together today with the fathers that it's important not to have one bad thought about our fellows in the monastery, that each one of us should stand before God and God sees all the community in his heart. The unity of the community is in the heart of each one of us, not only in the heart of the woman. And the, when we uh, harbor a bad thought about someone, we mutilate our existence. Because Father Sophia used to say, if we have a bad thought about one of our fellows, it's a crack on the wall of the church, he says, of the monastery. So the unity and uh, is expressed by this understanding to keep everybody in our heart and avoid a single bad thought about the others. And in marriage, the same. If the couple learn not to accept any bad thought for one another and to have a competition like we have in the monastery in this sacrament of obedience, the other is important. Whatever the woman says, yes, you are blessing me. And I accept the will of the other, and the other is important, not myself. And at the end, I learn to accept the will of the primary other, Christ, our, our Savior. Uh, like in monastic, uh, it, is, uh, it is the same in, in, in marriage. If the couple have a competition, who will do more the will of the other, humbling one another before, before the other, humbling each before the other, then it would be an antechamber of paradise, their life, and not their physical contact, but this union of heart, the union of spirit, it will bring the real accomplishment, a spiritual accomplishment, which those who are born of the spirit in the monasteries are those who have a competition who will humble more himself before the others. They have this divine, let's say, divine competition. And that, if, if there is the same in the family, not to accept any bad thought, to have this competition, who will do more the will of the other, who will humble himself more in front of his partner. If we, if we bear all the, all the family in our heart before God, present them before God, that will be surely unity and love. It's a matter of heart. Everything takes place there. All those principles who apply in the monastic life, apply. we said about the first love and the first grace. It's the same in the marriage. We meet the first years, lots of love and, 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 and happiness. But we shouldn't forget that. When the difficulties come and the, the bills increase and the children come to take our sleep away and, the, and, they need, and, and, and there is a lot of uh, the, the more demands on us, we mustn't forget that we must continue in the same fidelity and love as God has given us to begin our life. Remember thy first love. Apply the same principles and the, the end will be good. I know from my family. The first 18 years of my parents were terrible. But suddenly they, they were patient though with one another. And suddenly they, they found it. And they started and they, they, they lived another 30 years in great peace and in great love. And they both died full of days. Not full of days, many days. Full of days. When we say in the lives of the saints, they died full of days. Each day had the fullness of grace of God, the peace of grace. So it was worth being patient in 10 years and live another 30 years so happy, so fulfilled, and to have such a glorious end. My father, and, uh, for, uh, he felt his coming to the end, and he started kissing the hands of my mother 
uh, they were in bed and he started kissing the hands of, of my mother, blessing his father-in-law who gave him such a companion for his life. And the next morning he died. And uh, my mother said to me, if your dad is not saved, no one will be saved. I said to him, why? Half a night he is praying, he, she said to me. And this is, in, in, not at the time when I was with them, hardly, hardly they prayed. They went to church more or less regularly, but I didn't see any particular zeal. But when I became a monk and they came to a monastery, they stole, they stole both of them the, the, the prayer from the, from the monks there. <laughs> and they left and they continued in that way. Uh, 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 you understand? It was worth being patient 18 years and live the other 30 years with such uh, a grace and with such love, with such peace. Nowadays, from the first difficult, oh, we don't much. Goodbye. And, you know, I don't, I don't see anybody healed, anybody fulfilled from such, uh, mm-hmm. such, um, from, from such a thing. You understand? So the same things, the same principles who, which apply in the life of the monks, apply also in the life of the couples. I remember I had a professor in patrology in Paris. He was Cypriot. He was a Cypriot who used to say, "I think the best preparation for marriage is monasticism." <laughs> <laughs> and he got shocked. And I said to him, "But what do you mean?" He says to me, "Look, I was preparing to be a monk, and suddenly the circumstances came in such a way that I married. But I'm very grateful to God that I was preparing to be a monk." And now I know how to fight against my pride and live happily with my wife and know the true principles of life which I learned preparing to become a monk. And also I was preserved and now I can become a priest. And he became a priest. So, and he was putting it in such a way which if you had only that without knowing his mind, you would be shocked. But he, he was a very holy person, very holy man. You know him, yes, him. very nice person. May God grant him a good end. He's sorry now, but he's still alive. Yes. So remember that the same principles that apply in the monastic life apply also for the couples. And the same fidelity who is demanded of monks obedience and fidelity is demanded of the couples. And then we build life. We, what does that mean? We build the temple of God, not only in us, but in our fellows as well. And which is our destiny. We'd like to thank everybody again for coming. It's been nice to have you with us. Uh, in the morning, uh, liturgy will begin the hours at 9.10. Uh, liturgy will begin at 9.30, and uh, Father Zacharias will, will, will be our guest homeless. And they said everything tonight. <laughs> you can sleep on it. <laughs> so tomorrow we'll have him as our guest homeless. And again, it's been so nice, Father, for you to come to visit us. We're honored. We're blessed. We're so thankful. Uh, that you're with us today, and that uh, we ask you, God to continue to bless you for many years. So, if you'd like to uh, help clean up at all, please uh, uh, stay. Uh, God willing, we'll see you in the morning, and uh, we could all rise and sing it is truly me. <laughs> Oh,